What you're seeing is an amazing robotic orchestra called Absolute Quartet. Rubber balls are shot roughly six feet in the air, landing with absolute precision on marimba keys. It's actually three machines, the other a series of spinning wine glasses dampened by robotic fingers. The third is an array of ethnic percussion instruments. But the fourth member of the quartet is the web user at home, who logs onto the website and inputs a short musical snippet that the machine will then perform. When it was exhibited in 2008, Absolute Quartet became an entirely new interactive musical experience. It's what's being called an electromechanical sculpture, fusing art with science. Hello, and welcome to CU Science Update. I'm your host, Stephanie Robinson. Absolute Quartet was designed and operated by New York artists Dan Paluska and Jeff Lieberman in collaboration with the Swedish media studio Teenage Engineering. Since then, Jeff Lieberman has been hard at work with performances and other technological sculptures. In early April of 2011, he was invited to CU's 63rd Annual Conference on World Affairs. Not only is he an artist, musician, and roboticist, Jeff is also a well-renowned time-lapse photographer, using cameras that can allow us to perceive everyday events like we've never seen them before. Fortunately, Jeff was able to make time to join us here in the studio, where he chats about his work with CU Science Update's Priscilla Carlson. Oh my god, that's so weird. We thought they might sit this one out. Rocking. Wow. <laughs> I am psyched, man. Matt just had his hand on fire, most of his arm on fire. I'm going to try not to cry until it's your turn. Okay. But both reached right in. Here we go. And grabbed the flame by, hmm, uh, how would Jeff phrase it? Yeah, that's insane. Make a fist. Grabbed the flame by its exothermic reaction. Damn. I felt a little like a superhero for a second. Uh, you have um, done a lot with science and art, and where do you come up with a lot of your ideas? That's a good question. It's kind of changed over the years. I think for the, in the beginning, first of all, for the first 20 years, science and art were completely separate uh -huh. for me. I was doing a lot of science and then a lot of music and painting and sort of that, that sort of thing, and there was no intersection between the two. Uh, when I went to the Media Lab, I started working on robotics and using robotics and my science knowledge to build art installations. And so that was a big kind of transformation for me to realize that I could be actively merging the two fields together. And so the first reaction to that was I kind of started rifling through all these scientific principles that I knew that people didn't understand or people didn't really appreciate. And I tried to design them into aesthetic experiences for people. So I did a lot with things like electromagnetic levitation and persistence of vision where you can make these optical illusions where things look like they're completely impossible. Uh, and then after that, it just was kind of, uh, I think the way the creative process usually works is you leave yourself open to things happening and you see something and it just triggers a spark of something. And it's, uh, I think it's less an active process that we, than we typically think it is. I think it's more about uh, remaining open to, to the unknown and open to something new coming in. And so I try to just, uh, when I see something, I just try to see it fresh, like I, I'm not sure I know what it is. And in those questions, I think a lot of ideas for pieces come up. What are you working on right now? Okay, so let me try to see if I can cover the whole list. Um, I, I, my life is very project based, so I don't have any kind of nine to five or anything like that. There'll be weeks where I'm working 120 hours a week followed by three weeks of absolutely nothing. So I'm doing a museum installation right now for the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, where we're building a 120 foot long suspended glass uh, LCD based sculpture, which is 5,000 uh, five by five inch LCD tiles. So this whole thing looks like a glass ribbon that's 10 feet wide, 120 feet long, like a suspended piece of glass uh, that's transparent, but it can all turn opaque black. And so you can play out these natural science patterns in this natural science museum in this very digital way. Uh, that's uh, kind of a short version of, of project one. Uh, I'm 
working on manufacturing a little sculpture of mine that's an optical illusion sculpture. I'm also working with my friend Eric Gunther. I work with him on all these projects pretty much. Uh, working with him on a new music video. We, we previously directed another music video about six or six or twelve months ago. It's kind of feels like it's eight years ago. Um, and then I'm also doing a lot of research just on my own into the intersections between things like meditation, uh, the spiritual traditions, the contemplative traditions, and modern neuroscience and kind of the evolution of human consciousness and trying to figure out all the science that I've taken in over the last 33 years, how does that merge with our views of religion and spirituality instead of reject them. So how did you come to do all of this stuff? Like where did it where did this all begin when you decided, I want to blend science and art? How did that concept come to be? Uh, a lot of years of struggling, you know, a lot of years of doing them separately and saying, man, if I only did art, I could get really good at art. Or if I only did science, I'd get really good at science. But every time I focused on one, the other one would kind of call me back and I'd go back and forth. And so years of that, probably 10 years of just going back and forth, going back and forth. And then starting to realize they could be the same. Um, and the same thing happened, you know, I started with physics and math and I was totally sure I wanted to be doing physics or math as a professor in academia. And then at the last year of my undergraduate, I started building something. I took a robotics class and I built a machine for the first time and that made me realize, you know, I could be doing a lot of things on paper, but I could reach people in a totally different visceral way if I built physical objects. Uh, and so I started trying to embed some of these pieces of science, as we talked before, into these physical objects. Um, and kind of the more that I learn, the more that I know I don't know. So whatever curiosity I had before, it always opens up some new field. So you know, now I'm studying consciousness and neuroscience. I don't know those things at all. But the interesting thing is when you come from these other fields like math and you look at neuroscience, you interpret it differently than a neuroscientist would because you interpret it in terms of math. Uh -huh. And that, that can open up new insights that other people might not have had. And so some things that are really difficult for me to understand are really trivial for a neuroscientist, but if I start getting into combinatorial graph theory, it's, it switches around. So I think there's a, a general movement in the sciences now where we've split up all these fields and gotten hyper, hyper specialized, and the people that are starting to cross-pollinate a little bit and resynthesize are adding a lot of new, you know, important information. I'm not claiming to add any important information of my own, but theoretically that's happening. Out of curiosity, what was the first robotics thing you invented? Um, I, the first thing I made, I wouldn't call an invention. The first class I took uh, is a robot design competition. And so it's a great way to learn how to use machine tools, how to put things together, how to control them electromechanically. Um, and they always give you some kind of puzzle, like there's some kind of board or something, and they say, okay, it's going to be one-on-one, -on -one, and you're going to have 60 seconds to do some such thing. And ours was about getting hockey pucks in these little holes up on a hill. So you could either go up there or throw them up there or whatever. Um, that was not really an invention. It was more of a means to kind of just learn things. Uh, but as soon as I started getting comfortable, my first artistic installation was one called Cyberflora, where it was a field of 20 robotic flowers. And typically in artificial intelligence, we work on one amazingly expensive robot that costs a couple million dollars, no one wants to touch it, and, and it's a really high level of intelligence, trying to approximate human intelligence. So here the idea was to build a really disparate set of robots, so tw uh, 20 simple, simple robots that had very, very trivial sensors. But with that trivial sensor, like if it's a distance sensor, I can still gauge if you're trying to attack me or you're just kind of nearby, and I can build in simple responses to that. So we built in engagement responses and fear responses uh, into all of these flowers in a different way. And so it kind of gave this ecological form of intelligence where you would move your hands around in the whole garden and you'd see all of them reacting to you. And it'd give you a whole different feel of how you could embed intelligence in a machine. And is that still, I mean, do you still have that available, or is that? Um, if, it depends on the price tag, if you're interested <laughs> in getting it. It's, uh, it was one of these things where we used a lot of hobby servo motors to run it, and we ran it straight 16 hours a day for 12 months, and most of those servo motors last only about that long. 
So all of them need replacing. So it's basically sitting there, the whole thing exists and all the motors are, are burnt out. So really it comes down to the price tag. If someone had the right amount of money to replace all the motors and everything, we could get it running again. What do you think has been your greatest invention so far? I don't think I've invented it yet, but I've got an idea that I think is, is headed somewhere. And it's this idea of, uh, we're starting to understand that meditation really deeply affects the brain in a very, very short time. We were, we're doing studies on 12 week long studies where people meditate half hour a day and you can already measure on an fMRI uh, gray matter and white matter shifts. Um, but I'm pretty convinced based on my knowledge of uh, kind of neurofeed, not neurofeedback, but biofeedback and how our motor system learns uh, that we can apply some of these technologies of biofeedback to meditative states. So typically when you have meditation masters, they've spent 10,000 hours meditating and, and they've gotten to places that they describe are completely different ways of understanding reality than most humans do. And the more that I learn about it, the more I, I believe that what they're talking about are, are kind of future transrational stages of human consciousness. You know, we think of ourselves as the end all be all of creation and, and for sure in the future that's gonna change. So I think a lot of these people have tapped into it, but it takes an enormous amount of practice. It takes 10,000 or so hours to start having these insights. And I, I really sincerely believe that these, new, these technologies of EEG that have been available in labs but are now starting to become available to the public uh, have a really huge potential to accelerate our ability to enter into meditative states, to learn about these different stages of consciousness. So that's the thing I'm working on right now that I'm really most passionate about and I think has the most potential to help people. Cool. Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Well, you never know. I mean, that's one of the dangers with scientific knowledge is you don't know if it's going to do good or evil. I mean, I don't even know if one of those things is going to keep people held back further and get us into kind of mental traps. And it's one of the reasons I'd like to talk more to some of these masters of meditation who might have a better perspective on if these are even things you could possibly ever accelerate. You know, maybe it always requires that much time. And what are your hopes for that? I mean... I would say in the deepest sense, it's to reduce human suffering. I think uh, when you look back at, when you really let yourself ask the question of why do human beings suffer, it always comes down to the voice that's in the people's head. And it's not ever about what's going on in the world, it's about our interpretation of the world. And you know, I, I, can, I can be in physical pain, right? Someone can slice my finger off, but that's separate from suffering. And suffering happens when I see my current situation and I, and I judge it relative to what else it could be in the future or what it could have been in the past or even right now. And so I can get jealous, I can have desire, I can have fear and anxiety. And all those things are mental states that can only exist in humans. No other animal that we know of can be jealous. No other animal that we know of can have anxiety about something that's just in its head. The, thing, the lion has to be there. So I think we create heaven or hell on earth based on what our mind is telling us. And I think a lot of us in today's society, especially with all the craziness that's going on around us, uh, we suffer a lot. And there's a huge amount of depression and anxiety, especially in the U.S. Uh, and we're the most well-off country economically in the world. So what, are, what is the point? You know, I've seen impoverished people that are happier than people I know that are rich. And, you know, this, the whole, when you look at celebrity and you see how many people have major uh, addiction problems, depression problems, clearly the economics is not the, the savior of us. And yet our, our media tends to portray it as such. So we're kind of stuck in this loop of like thinking economics is the solution to our problems. But I think it's causing a lot of them for a lot of people. Um. So tell us a little bit about Time Warp. Time Warp, so Time Warp is a show where the goal is to get people excited about science. I think on the most fundamental level, it's about taking people who typically don't care about science one way or the other, showing them a couple experiences that they would have taken for granted about the world around them and showing them that it's nothing like what they would have thought and having that open up some sense of awe or wonder. and. And uh, as Neil Armstrong said, you know, wonder is the basis for, our, for man's desire to understand. And I think if you can trigger that in someone for even a second, you open them up to an interest in science. So what we did, and this is a kind of almost like a trick, it's an easy way to get at that at point, is we use technologies like visual technologies like ultra slow motion video, where I can take a water droplet that falls in a half a second and I can play it so slow that it takes me 10 minutes to play back. And I can see details in that motion that no human being can ever see with their eyes, no matter how much training. 
And that's true of X-ray, infrared vision, ultraviolet vision. So we used all these kinds of technologies to reveal the world in ways that a human being can't see. And that tends to open people up, open people's eyes up. So that was the goal. So we did two seasons and it ended filming about a year ago. And um, what's, what's next? Wait, are you going to be doing any more Time Warp or is it done completely? So Time Warp is done filming. I've been talking kind of off to the side to different people about different potential projects. But, uh, you know, getting involved in TV and in media was always secondary for me. They found me. It was not my idea for the show or anything like that. Um, they just say they had seen my work actually using high-speed imaging uh, and said, okay, you know the photography and you know the science, so why don't you get involved in this? So it wasn't really my impetus to have the show. Um, I think this, the other side of that, though, is a, a TV show has the potential to reach so many people. And there were times when I, I got one line of science into a segment and I realized, okay, a million people now know this cool thing. And so that was really powerful for me. That's why I, I think all of this stuff is really has the power to be so beneficial to society, but also, as we know from a lot of reality TV and that sort of thing, has the potential to go the other way. Uh -huh. um, so I don't know what's going to happen for me in the future. Right now, I'm kind of just working on the things that are present and trying to leave some open space so that if things come along, I'm, I'm ready to do them. Can you talk a little bit about your robotic suit? Yeah, yeah. So I was at the Media Lab for six years, early on doing projects like Cyberflora, like we talked about, and later on uh, for my master's thesis, I was trying to study motor learning, and I was trying to study, uh, take a simple example, a golf swing. My dad is really into golfing, and everyone wants to improve their game, and the technicalities of improving your game are so subtle and so quick timings. Some of these things are 10 to 100 milliseconds long. Uh, when you typically learn from a teacher, they watch what you do, and then they correct you. And so there's this couple seconds delay, and they either correct you by telling you something, so you have to kind of map it into your body, or if that doesn't work, they actually grab your body and they try to help you, help you move. So my idea for the invention was, what if you have a suit that is covering your entire body, and there's a teacher and a student, and as the teacher performs something, you can record it, and the student tries to replicate the motion of the teacher, and as you do from moment to moment, your motion is compared to the teacher's. So say I'm supposed to have my wrist like this, but my wrist is like this. There's vibrating motors all over the suit, and the more off I am on every joint, the more that that area will vibrate. So instead of having a time delay to get this kind of feedback, right as I'm trying to replicate the motion, I feel how I'm wrong. And one of the, the deepest things I learned through researching motor learning is that the quicker you can get feedback about how you're doing, uh, the more you, your brain can use it and improve its motion. And so typically, you know, if I'm at a golf lesson, it might be five, 10 seconds, but I can actually do it in five milliseconds. I can have that feedback so quick that I can just keep doing this swing and keep feeling what's wrong. And just, I can take 20 swings and that might be equivalent to 10 months of practice otherwise, because I can hyper, you know, hyper, the, hyper accentuate the feedback basically. And so what other applications would that be used for? Could you use it for like possibly rehab? I think so. We never tested it, so I don't want to pretend that we had all the solutions for rehab, but there's definitely a lot of potential to try to reprogram after strokes and that sort of thing, or for physical therapy, to try to reprogram what's going on in a way where the person's not getting their own feedback. Um, we haven't tested that. There's a, there's a lot of systems that do that with motors, so they actively help you move, and that helps you train. And the idea by using vibrating motors is that you're doing all the action yourself, so your neurons still have to be sending that signal uh, but you're getting informational feedback. And just an initial test that we did, you know, they showed a lot of promise, but we haven't gone into kind of FDA stages or anything crazy like that. I think there's also a lot of the potential for, for the blind uh, to, as directional facility in a totally different way than we used it. There's been people using things like vibrotactile feedback to help guide people, and there's been people even doing things as crazy as they'll put a camera right where a blind person would be looking, and they'll take a, an array of electric, uh, you know, basically wires, and they put it on your tongue or on somewhere like your back, and they'll play out the light and dark image on your tongue, and after using this for a couple minutes, even, or a couple hours especially, your mind is able to use that as a spatial reference. And so even with no function in your eyes, you can suddenly navigate with your tongue. So there's a lot of these cross-modal mappings that are possible that we've just started getting into. It's pretty exciting. I can only imagine 100 years from now uh, what's going to be happening with it. Well, it definitely sounds like you're making you know, a lot of contributions between the meditation and the robotics and just blending science and art together. So 
Um, I, any final thoughts or anything you want to add, something that you're excited about? Um, the thing that I'm more and more excited about that took me probably 30 to 33 years, I'm 33 now, it took me probably 30 years to start noticing is, is that questions are more important than answers. And the more that I've seen myself open to the fact that I don't know something, uh, the more that I gain understanding. And it's, it's ironic because our education is so focused on knowing a certain set of facts. And I think uh, in some sense that that whole process is backwards. And it's, it's much more important to have someone finish school knowing nothing but having an attitude of wanting to know more all the time and feeling okay in uh, uncertain territory. We'd like to thank Jeff Lieberman for joining us today. There will be more shows to follow with other guests from the Conference on World Affairs, so stay tuned. In the meantime, you can watch other episodes on iTunes or visit our website at cuscienceupdate.com. And don't forget to like us on our Facebook page. See you next time.